Welcome to week five. This week, we are focusing on the impact of internet and the information technology on the realization and protection of freedom of expression. In this first segment, I will introduce some of the challenges that internet has created for the protection of free speech. And I will particularly highlight four of them. The first one will be the tension between the borderless nature of internet and national sovereignty. The second is the impact of media convergence on medium-specific regulation. The third is the responsibility or liability of all the actors involved with the production and circulation of information. And finally, we will turn our attention to the global governance of Internet. So let's begin. This is June 2016. There are currently about 3.5 billion people online. That's about 40% of the world population, 4-0. In 1995, 20 years ago, it was just 1% of the world population that was online. The graph on your screen highlight the speed of the development over the last 20 years and its global spread. Internet may be said to have founded a radically different information ecosystem, unprecedented in human history. This revolution stems from the number of people involved, the borderless nature of the medium and of the information that may be accessed and the speed at which it travels. But the revolutionary nature and impact of internet also come from the fact that these 3.5 billion people are not just consumers of information, but they are also potentially producers of information including videos, movies, radio programs, opinions, news. I have already laid out here both an incredible number of opportunities for the realization of freedom of expression and information, as well as a daunting number of challenges for its regulation. But you may ask, why? Why, do, why does it need to be regulated? After all, this is the most formidable technology through which the vision of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19, may be truly implemented. Well, there is one evident answer with this. The fact that this freedom, that this uh, information and expression are exercised online does not imply or does not mean that international standards are no longer applicable. So Article 19 of the Universal Declaration or of the International Covenant and indeed its equivalent under regional convention, all of them e apply equally to online expression. The application of international human rights law to the online world has many positive effects. So it's not just about regulation, but it's also about protection. It means that the online space may be regulated, but also protected as per the conditions laid out by international human rights law. In particular, any restriction to freedom of expression and information online must meet the three-part test of legality, valid grounds, and necessity. Well, this is, however, not so straightforward. The opportunities created by internet have literally scared many government. And then came the 2011 Arab Spring revolutions and many saw them, many government, saw those revolutions as the expression of the liberating power of internet. By the way, social media did play a major role in supporting the call for those revolutions, but I think that uh, this has been largely overstated. This was not the Twitter revolution, but that's a different topic. Still, the fact that some degree of organization took place online has given further arguments to those in power fearing a technology and an information they simply could not control. And so the online world has become over the last decade the object of a plethora of many specific laws, 
policies and practices, many of which fail to meet the international standard related to freedom of expression. This problem is compounded by the fact that international norms or policies on freedom of expression and information built over the last 50 years or so have not easily been transferred, been exported into the online space. Indeed, a range of challenges has emerged, which I will highlight now, at least four of them. The first one is a transboundary and geography-defying quality of online expression. It has founded a global communication and information system that does not respect much national sovereignty or jurisdictions. Information travels across borders in ways that has never been seen before. So far throughout this lesson, we have highlighted the obligations placed upon the state to protect and respect freedom of expression. But what if the states cannot do it? What if the information travel in such a fashion that states have no longer control all jurisdictions over that information? Well, this is exactly what, that, what is happening right now with, with internet. Scholars and cyber activists have repeatedly emphasized that the state was not directly central to the development and growth of internet. Indeed, it was not even very much present over the first 20 years of internet existence. Other actors founded what has been described as a post-Westphalian internet world. These include technology developers, innovators, the corporate sectors, and indeed internet users themselves who have played a fairly central role in the growth of internet. The transborder nature of almost all information flows, along with a central role played by non-state actors in its creation and circulation, raise large problems for an international system that is based on the central role of the state, that is based on national sovereignty, national jurisdiction. So from our standpoint, which is that of freedom of expression, the first challenge is really how do we preserve the global nature of cyberspace while operating in a system still characterized by national sovereignty and as embodied by national laws? Indeed, is it possible to preserve that global nature? This challenge is further complicated by the fact that many national laws regulating actors, content, and activities online fail to meet international standards. There are laws criminalizing legitimate expression, laws requesting online registration of bloggers, of websites, of journalists. There are laws, policies, and technologies to filter or block access to legitimate content online, and including entire website or IP addresses, and so on and so forth. These are coming on top of the practice of surveillance, whose legality is still the object of huge legal debates and, and judicial challenges. In 2013, Edward Snowden's revelation of ma massive NSA surveillance of internet transactions pointed to the state extending its covert operation to the internet and to the collection of big data, practices which for many of us fail to meet international human rights standards. The result of all those processes are twofold. First, the multiplication of human rights violations in the digital space, an outcome which we are discussing throughout this course. Second, what we are also witnessing, according to the World Economic Forum, are trends towards internet fragmentation and the renationalization of cyberspace. I think the two concepts of fragmentation and renationalization are pretty clear uh, and pretty indicative of what it means. Others have spoken of states engaging in hyper-territoriality. So it's not just about state conquering back 
the cyberspace, but it's also about space extending their control over spaces that are way beyond the national jurisdictions and national borders. So what we have is um, the reconstruction of cyberspace through state actions. And that reconstruction is very much challenging what had been at the heart of the creation of internet, which was the um, establishment of a global community, of a global uh, flow of information. No borders, borderless flows of information. These are currently highly challenged by the reconquering of the space by the nation state. I will now turn to a second challenge that um, we are witnessing at the moment, a challenge that Internet has placed uh, to freedom of expression. The Internet technology has deeply challenged the medium-specific approach to regulation. We discussed last week how around the world the regulation of broadcasting tend to be much stricter than that of print media because of the necessity to allocate airways that are in short supply. So that's what is meant by medium-specific regulation. Under the prevalent global norms, print media is in should not be regulated at all because there is nothing in short supply. In the 1990s, it was hoped that the same medium-specific approach could apply to internet. In 1997, the US Supreme Court delivered one of the first rulings over freedom of expression online, a ruling which has been cited globally. That's Renault v. ACLU. And in that ruling, which is uh, in your uh, reading for the week, the court ruled that the internet was more like the print media than broadcasting because there is no history of lesser protection on internet, there is no bandwidth limitation, and users have control over what they can access, including, for instance, indecent expression. Therefore, in the opinion of the Supreme Court of the United States, internet is deserving of the strongest First Amendment protection. That means that the state should not regulate online content. Over the last two decades or so, though, technological development have challenged the medium-specific approach to content regulation. Indeed, information technology has allowed for a process that has been referred to as convergence across media platform. And as a result, the strict boundaries between medium of communication have disappeared, and thus the rationale, the raison d'être for the different forms of regulations have also evaporated. So, for instance, newspapers have online content, which may include videos and radio programs. In such cases, what applies? Is it a broadcasting? Is it print? Is it internet? Television or radio may be broadcasted through internet and not airways. So what kind of regulation do we then apply? Under such conditions, medium-specific regulations become increasingly difficult to justify. Can there be one type of regulation only for internet-derived content? And if newspapers have online version, which includes video and audio programs, how are they to be regulated? As we will see, with a possible exception of the United States, countries have moved towards imposing a range of obligations and much stronger regulations upon Internet content and Internet actors, including the so-called intermediaries. A third challenge, which I wish to highlight to you, is that related to the actors involved in the production, distribution and control of online content. These actors are very different from the previous information system and the previous information generation. They do not quite compare very well with what the, the information system looked like 
let's say 20 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. An internet service provider is not quite the same as a phone company or indeed as a printing press. Indeed, internet service providers are deeply different among each other in terms of their role with regard to the production and control over content information. Facebook and Twitter are certainly not the New York Times. But then what are they? Search engines have never existed like they do now. Google is not a dictionary. Wikipedia is not the Britannica encyclopedia. But what are they? And so many questions are raised from a freedom of expression standpoint because the protection and the regulation of freedom of expression depends heavily on how we define the medium through which information is being produced, controlled, distributed. In the offline world of media, publishers are responsible for what they publish. But is there such a thing as a publisher in the online world, beside the original creator of content? If yes, is it the server that stores the content, the search engine that finds the content, or the internet service providers that delivers the content? Is it one of the three, two of the three, or all three? What are the specific roles and responsibilities of these various actors as far as the protection and regulation of freedom of expression is concerned? Let me put it in even simpler terms. Is Facebook legally responsible for something you may post on your profile? In the same way the New York Times may be responsible for the articles its journalists and editors are publishing. The interactivity, immediacy, and accessibility of online content with limited editorial control or filters, the multiplication of content producers, all of that create many challenges in terms of the regulation of journalism and media and protection of freedom of expression and, and, press, and press freedom. Who is a journalist in the digital era? what constitute the medias? All of those questions, all of those challenges are at the heart of some of the difficulties that both governments, corporate actors, users, civil society are facing when looking at the protection of online freedom of expression. Who is responsible for what? Let me end with a fourth challenge, which, which is a challenge of global governance. This is, of course, not unique to internet. For instance, phone lines have demanded global protocols and commitment to enforce them so that people could call each other across borders and indeed across oceans. So did satellite broadcasting. What is unique to internet and makes for the complexity of its governance is firstly the nature of the technology itself, both hardware and software required to make it work. For each of those critical components, and there are many of them, there must be some common global understanding, governance and institutions to carry and implement possible agreement. And then there must also be an overall and integrated approach, not just a piecemeal approach to this governance and oversight over those critical components. For instance, think about the complexity behind the global domain name system. It is not just a question of complex technology, but also a question of complex global governance, which must sustain the interactive and exponential growth of the DNS, domain name system. Otherwise, the system will collapse under the weight of its growth with multiplication of names, competitions, and overlap, and security breach. Directly or indirectly, the governance over each of the critical components of internet, hardware, and software may impact on the realization of freedom of expression. 
the governance of internet has followed to date a multi-stakeholder approach. It means a model of governance involving equal participation, in theory at least, of a number of stakeholders. It also means some form of consensus-based decision-making and an open and transparent process. Those stakeholders are those that have been involved in the development, growth, and use of internet. The multi-stakeholder approach is not just a generous gesture on the part of government. It is a necessity. The corporate sector, the users, the innovators, the technologists, the civil society, all play a crucial role which cannot be ignored or fully tamed by government. Their buy-in and contribution to the regulation of internet are necessary conditions to the success of this third regulatory generation. This multi-stakeholder approach, though, is not without its detractors, beginning with China, which has been advocating for a governance system based on and involving state only. This is a concept of internet sovereignty or cyber sovereignty. The result is that the global governance of internet, the principles that should guide it, the actors that should get involved, and the institution that should support it, all of these are far from settled. On the contrary, there too we are witnessing normative policy and political conflict. China is championing an extreme form of cyber sovereignty in keeping with its model of centralized state-driven system in the offline world. But even those governments advocating for a multi-stakeholder approach to global governance of Internet have taken steps towards establishing state-based control over the cyberspace. Already in 2006, the historical transformation of Internet towards greater state control had been well captured by one of the most important theorists and thinkers behind the Internet, Lawrence Lessing, who wrote, the first generation of the architectures was built by a non-commercial sector, researchers and hackers focused upon building a network. The second generation has been built by the commerce. And the third, not yet off the drawing board, could well be the product of government. He was writing that 10 years ago in 2006. 10 years later, there is indeed no doubt. Governments have largely taken over the regulation of Internet that the third generation of Internet regulation. This is an understandable development given the ubiquitous nature of Internet and information technology. It's not just about communication. The economy has digitalized globally. Crimes have digitalized. War can be waged through cyber means. And so, as I have highlighted at the beginning of this segment, the governance of the cyber world is the object of a plethora of laws and policies at national level and many debates at global level to try to take stock of the exponential growth of internet in all aspects of our life, in all aspects of economic life, of social life, of financial life, of culture, and so on. To sum up, in this introduction, I have presented very briefly what makes the internet a unique and unprecedented medium of communication. And I have highlighted only some of the challenges that the nature of this technology is generating for the protection and regulation of freedom of expression online. In the next segment, we will consider one of these challenges in greater detail, the role of the commercial sector and in particular of the intermediaries, the service providers, the social platform and others who are involved in generating, regulating, controlling and circulating information and therefore have a role to play 
with regard to the protection of freedom of expression online. Thank you.